Hello and welcome to Trade Finance Talks. My name is Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. The world of international trade often operates in the dark. Most of the world's goods are transported via the vast oceans, leaving plenty of space for illicit activity to occur. That is why it's vital to do proper checks on all parties involved and for governments to stay active in preventing international financial crime. In 1989, the G7 created the Financial Action Task Force to combat some of those illicit trades, specifically looking to tackle international money laundering. In 2001, the FATF scope expanded, including counterterrorism financing and proliferation financing. Now, to help us break down the FATF, and the role of anti-money laundering or know your customer in international trade and finance, I'm happy to introduce Mohamed Daoud, Director and Industry Practice Lead at Moody's. Mohamed, great to have you here from Dubai. Welcome to Trade Finance Talks. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Very good. Listen, I, I am very happy to uh, attend this session and uh, thank you for your time and your interest in the compliance space. Oh, such a pleasure. And this is following on from an, our exciting partnership with the ICC UAE's annual conference. So uh, with that in mind, M Mohammed, can you give a quick overview? Tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you, where are you from, and, and what do you do? I am a North African French. I have a background of 25 years banking and finance in US, Europe, Middle East. And I step up in this uh, issue related to anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing, and uh, other anti-bribery, anti-corruption program almost uh, 20 years ago. I became by default specialist. I um, collaborate and work with uh, Thompson Reuters for 10 years. I was uh, handling the business in the Middle East and Africa. And I joined recently Moody's on the same space related to financial crime, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing, which we call QIC, um, simply because uh, Moody's is coming with uh, new technology and a new data to try to uh, help the uh, different uh, corporate and the different institution in the region to get to the next step, I would say, uh, in combating money laundering and terrorist financing. Thank you very much. So, so I guess with that in mind, with two decades of experience, can you give a summary of the Financial Action Task Force or FATF and how it helps combat financial crime? The FATF, the FATF is an international watchdog, and their main role is to advise and to set up the standard and the guidelines how to fight money laundering, terrorist financing, through what we call a 40 plus nine recommendation. And their main objective is to infuse and to convince the different jurisdiction in the country to embed it and to, I would say, uh, change their legislation to include combating money laundering and financial terrorism and all other uh, illicit financial crime. So a country need to have the legal framework has been adapted and updated in order to be able to freeze assets, close account, do an investigation. So the FATF is, the, I would say, the sponsor and the help of different countries to do that. And in the same times, the FATF are doing every I would say three, four years uh, period, a review, which call, we call mutual evaluation to evaluate if a country has been really and effectively implementing new legislation, policy, uh, uh, supervision on combating money laundering. And uh, based on this uh, review, the, the country can pass or can be in uh, what we call uh, uh, scrutiny, okay, in gray list, 
which is um, which is uh, the way to uh, to to help the country to improve their uh, fight against the money laundering and terrorist financing. Thank you very much. So I guess with that three year review, can you talk about how FATF enforcement has progressed throughout the years and given your your experience over the past 20? My experience is in the, they this uh, this enforcement, whether the FATF or the different regulators, because every country has their own regulators and there is a different regulator and authority by sector. There is one for the banking, like the central bank. There is one for the non-banking sector or the insurance. Okay, um, they, they, we saw the enforcement going by wave. Okay, in the beginning, not expecting every single sector to comply. The focus was mainly on tier one banks, which is a large bank and a large financial institution, and then. It came that starting positioning and focusing on cross-border remittances because it was considered to be high-risk sector simply because you can send money to terrorists or money launderer without knowing. And uh, this is where the KYC principle and the know your customer and know your third party has been established. And then we saw insurance getting impacted, the insurance sector, and then we saw the capital market getting impacted. And recently, it's mainly, mainly the non-financial sector that has been uh, uh, in, the for, uh, in, in, the, in the review. And you will see, you see also that countries that was passing a few years back were not anymore because it became more tougher. And also because naturally the financial sector are very mature. They are most of the time in compliance, but the, comp the corporate sector, the specific uh, se service companies, uh, real estate, uh, in some of the sector, they have a weakness. And automatically, we are seeing a lot of, uh, how say, change and a lot of uh, enforcement and enhancement and uh, understanding better how to fight money laundering in this sector, of course. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I guess just from a banking and financial sector, what 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 was the compelling reason for that sector to actually comply with FATF and the AML CFT regulations in in the first place? First thing, because the, it's not only the regulators, with uh, whether the local or the international watchdog, the banking system is part of a network. And as part of the network, you have also to comply with your counterparty regulation. So if you are in emerging country and you are doing business with uh, with uh, another country and you are using one of the currency of, uh, how say, the Western uh, counterparty, whether in euro, sterling or dollar, then automatically you have to apply what these counterparty are having. Uh, there is a specificity in this uh, currency because the currency regulation is not where the transaction is happening. It is where the origin of the, the currency country is. So a currency issued by the US, then it apply the US regulation and the country issued by Euro will be Euro regulation. So therefore you are forced by default by your counterparty to apply and also this uh, part of, uh, I would say, recommendation and guidelines and the approach of these uh, policies are like very simple on the principle. If I am doing a business with you or I am doing business with the third party and I am establishing a principle, I don't finance a money launderer, I don't finance a terrorist, I don't do that, I don't uh, accept corruption, then you are expecting your counterparty to apply the same principle. So it is very like the club principle and the club value. And automatically 
it's became we are interrelated in the commerce and the business are interrelated and automatically you have to apply what is your what is expected from you from your counterparties and you have also to push your counterparties to apply what you are uh, how saying putting as a guideline a principle yeah and yeah. this is valid uh, when we talk about threat finance and uh, the cross border export import this is very uh, like because you are using a different uh, vehicle of sending the goods you are using a different company whether the export company or the import the shipping the ship the vessel and then you want to make sure that none of those actors in the chain are involved in the wrongdoing money laundering terrorist financing drug or other financial crime. So automatically, this principle of counterparty is very important and it is more perceived in the emerging world, emerging market, than maybe the developed market. Because as you know, the emerging market are strongly depending on currencies, dollar, trading is 80% in dollar. Um, it is uh, more dependent on third party, and therefore, you have to apply your, yes, you have to obey and to apply your own, uh, what your own regulator, national regulator is telling you. But 99% of those regulations are almost under from uh, a worldwide point of view. Thanks, Mohammed. And I guess on, on the notion of trade finance, and, and also I guess you brought up those correspondent banking relationships. Can you talk about the dependency between the banking and finance sector from a compliance perspective and the corporate sector from a compliance perspective? And, and we can flash that diagram of the local banks and the foreign counterparties on, on, on this screen. But, but first thing, there is a, this, there was a for many years, there was this perception from the corporate sector saying, since my transaction and my account are dormant in a bank, then the bank is responsible for everything. And the regulator clarified this over time saying, no, there is a liability. If I am deciding to work with this entity, it's me. The bank is just facilitator of transaction. They are not responsible for the, so the QIC and know your customer apply to the regula to the corporate sector. The banks, uh, we are talking about correspondent bank. Since we are saying the regulation of currency apply in the origin, uh, the source and the origin of the currency, which is in this case, if it's a dollar and 80% of the trade finance and the trade are made in dollar, therefore it is the, it is the US regulation which apply. And therefore, the correspondent bank in the US, the US bank who are subsiding or subcontracting the transaction through you as a foreign bank, they are, they are under the same pressure. They have their government and their regulator telling them to not do business with terrorists or to not be do business with sanctioned party. And therefore, since the transaction you are, the, you are their partner and they are doing the transaction through you or you are using their system, their currency and their banking system and then financial system to do the transaction, then you have to apply what these correspondent banking rules they are under, which is their regulation. So automatically, the uh, most of the, uh, in the beginning, the financial sector get more mature and more advanced in the compliance because first thing they have all their party to guide them to to guide them they were automatically understanding better this policy from the country parties so if they were doing business with uk the uk party will be asking a lot of things a lot of questions if we, they were doing a business in euro the euro party will be asking a lot of things the same thing here uh, japanese the same thing uh, singaporean dollar whatever so the control in the banking system, the maturity has been uplift by the control parties and the correspondent banks, which was not the case in the re, in the uh, corporate space. And why the regulation started with the finance? Well, automatically, we the purpose was to track and to follow and to monitor every transaction happening in the world to see whether it's related to money laundering, terrorist financing. Or, uh, 
a weapon of mass destruction or any other, uh, how say, financial crime. So it's very easy to track uh, a digital transaction and transaction happening through the system. So automatically those sector was targeted as the one of the uh, uh, main sector to implement. And then we start realizing that you can, that then the, the movement went through more only function to understand who is behind the company. If there is a shell company just has been established to do a financial crime, you want to understand who is the owning this company, who is the ultimate ben beneficiary owners, who are the structure of the company, and therefore you start getting to the corporate sector as such. And in the corporate sector, you might have legal or lawyer handling a company, you might have a shell company, you might have a rogue and uh, I would say money launderer um, opening an account uh, a company every month doing business and closing this account. So the shifting is starting getting to, to uh, the corporate sector. And for one reason, if before I was able to money launderer to send money or terrorists, which is even worse, which mean that I was sending transaction through the network, which was money. And therefore there is a big scrutiny about the international financial system, who is doing what. Then I will shift and instead sending the money, I, sell, I will sell the goods that can be sold on the other side. Okay. And therefore the, uh, I'm not sending cash or money, I am sending goods that can be transformed, resell in the other side, or I am sending the equipment and the component to make the bomb or to make the weapon. And this became very serious because, and this is why there is a, a big focus in nowadays about trade finance, trade-based money laundering, and the emphasizes and the training and the awareness of all the actors that are happening in the, uh, I give you an example. I was in uh, India last week talking to one of the events and the question was, it is if you are as a bank giving a loan to do a trade finance, you are not only facilitating the trade-based money laundering, but you are financing this trade-based money laundering. So, you know, it is so therefore from the bank, to the other side of the bank and to the other, whether it is export or import, it is very, very important to check in the chain who is who and what they are doing and they are not involved in financial crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much for the overview. And I think you've given a really good uh, overview of, of, of the mechanisms and, and how it happens, I guess. Next up, let's talk about the actual data that that's available. So there is a lot of external sanctions data. You guys are one of the providers of, of them. Um, that really does have an impact on the easiness and, and the effectiveness of, of compliance. And, and, and we see that there are more than 300 lists issued by international regulations with different criteria. How do we actually go about setting these programs? You, you perhaps you could talk about the three different levels for for compliance screening. Listen, uh, first thing, you have a different uh, regulator and a different countries issuing list of sanctions. Let's say UK government are issuing political sanction. US are doing the same thing. United Nations are doing the same thing. You, you, Europe are doing the same thing. At the end, you will find an array of sanctions that are, okay. So you as a user or as a bank or as a, a trade finance or as a corporate company doing business, you would like to know if the party that you are doing business with is sanctioned or not. You have two options. One and feasible, which is accessing the website and downloading one by one all the lists and making sense of them, because you might have a list in, in this list, uh, Mohammed Dawood, and the other list, Mohammed Dawood, and the other list, Mohammed Dawood, and you are not sure whether it's the same entity or same individual, and if it's uh, sanctioned for the same purpose, and what is it? So you need to have an aggregator in the middle that can take all those lists, standardize them because every entity that we are talking, the government of the US government, they have their own 
description, their own codification, their own layout. United Nations, the same thing. Their lists are different in the description and the layout of the US. The same thing for the UK, same thing for Europe, same thing for the Swiss or whatever. So to get out of this headache in the understanding the list, you are conning, co connecting to an aggregator subscription to this data because they have a, a resource center and those people, their job is only to curate, aggregate, simplify, standardize, deduplicate the data. So this is for sanctions. And therefore there is a regulation for also politically exposed people which means people who has a grade and have a, a function in government or army or judicial of a company. This means that they have a big influencer. You have this database. So if the first database function, you might be able to access it through the website of the entity that are sanctioning. This one, it is a private. You need to get to, to get it through private, uh, I would say, uh, data provider like Moody's. The third one is when you want to do more enhanced due diligence, you might be looking to the adverse media. You are in the media and article because when the risk is high and the uh, reputation is high risk and the financial risk is high, you might be uh, trying to understand better who is this entity and everything. And if they're not sanctioned, because if the entity is sanctioned, it's easy. Now, when they are not sanctioned and you don't know them, you need to know more information. And recently, this last, I would say, three, four years, there is a big emphasizement on the ultimate beneficiary owner of a company, who is behind the company. And therefore, you need another set of data. And this data need to give you all the information about the corporate, this information, who is this company, who owned the company, what is the percentage, because some of the sanction are done they are issued and the condition are based on the percentage of the own ownership. Typically, example, the US issued since 2014 and the uh, Crimea crisis, they issued what we call sectorial sanction. So it's only a sector that is sanctioned, like the banking. And they are issuing a recommendation saying, we are listing this entity as a sanction. But any entities and any institution, any where these are having more than 50% are sanctioned in the world. There are thousands, but they are not listing them. And therefore, you need to get this information from a company like Moody's or a, an aggregator in the middle. Sure, sure. And, and, and actually, can you talk a little bit more about sanctions by extension? I think it's also known as the OFAC. 50% sanctions rule. What, well, first of all, what is OFAC? And secondly, what is the OFAC 50% sanctions the, rule? O, o, the OFAC is the Office for Foreign Asset Control, which is the uh, the US party that uh, do the control for all the policies and everything linked to money laundering. It's part of the US Treasury. And also, this is our, the entity that issued the list of sanctions. So before 2014, the OFAC was systematically listing all the entities that was sanctioned. So it was easy because you go to Moody's or you go to OFAC, you find almost the same information. And then after the first uh, Russian crisis with uh, Crimea, as I told you, the uh, US uh, start, and uh, it happened for Venezuela, the US start sanctioning a sector in oil sector in Venezuela, a banking and financial sector for Russia in 2014. And in this one, they are listing the name of the uh, Russian banks that were, as an example, that were sanctioned, and then putting a comment as what we call sanctioned by comment or sanctioned by extension or the 50% rules, which is, yes, these entities that nominatively are sanctioned, but also any institution in the world, any corporate, where these entities are having more than 51% holding, but they are not listing them. And therefore, it is very critical that you get this list from a private provider. And it's very important to have a corporate. Uh, so when you, when you are doing business with a corporate or you are opening an account for a corporate or you are doing a trade finance with another company, then it's very important to understand who is this company, what is their ownership, and to decide whether there is 51% ownership of this company 
from a sanctioned entity or sanctioned party, therefore the company is sanctioned or not. And this creates a lot of headache between brackets too many, many uh, uh, money, uh, how say, anti money laundering team and compliance team in the world. And this is why. When we are talking about sanction, we are talking about sanction, but we are saying, say, guys, there is not only sanction, there is a sanction, and there is a sanction by extension. And the sanction by extension is more headache than the first one, because at least the first one, it, you can download it and you can see who is, who is sanctioned. Sure, sure. And I guess looking at one of the other key actors within 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 the area is, is the airports, the seaports, the vessels, the tankers, the trading, exports, and imports partners, how are they impacted by the FATF, KYC, AML, or, or CFT regulations, Mohammed? I would say that if opening an account, they only check the customer name, and opening an account, they can only check the corporate name and maybe the directors. In the trade finance, typical, I think you have to check between 10 and 12 parties because every single actor has to be checked. You have to check. So the first thing, the uh, the uh, who is asking for import-export? Who is he? Who is the client? The second thing, he's going through what? Uh, which is the vessel that will be used to be, because a lot of ves vessel and tanker are sanctioned. And therefore, and also there is an agent in the middle, which is the export party or the import party, the customs, uh, the, the, the administration of the import export. And therefore you have the carrier and maybe the transport company. So you have a different actor in this that everybody needs to be checked. So the threat finance from a banking compliance point of view, is the most complex process. And, and I'm only talking about sanction because the you are supposed also to have a tracking system that check how many transactions, how many trade has happened with this country, what was the frequency, what is the amount, how many times, is it the same agent, is it the same customer, is this customer who was selling uh, um, metal or wood are changing and selling something else. Uh, if So the complexity of the trading make it that the trade-based money laundering is going to become one of the most on force. And I see it, I see a lot of requirement. Uh, and especially when you have a situation of war like today with Russia, and there is a lot of uh, shell company opening just an account in Dubai or in Singapore or in Turkey or elsewhere uh, in only to do one transaction to what we call to uh, circumvent the sanction, to do sanction evasion, which means that I am trying to create a company that are only for this purpose. I will put a shell company and I will put a partner or somebody on the front line and therefore, I do this transaction in order to uh, to avoid scrutiny and uh, and checking while the entity is functioning uh, currently. So we are seeing this a lot of in the threat uh, threat finance. Thank you very much, Mohammed. And and I guess final question. You know, looking at the overall picture, it, it's pretty complicated. You've got to bring together um, actors lists you've got to structure the data you've got to standardize it i guess what are the use cases for for technology and 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 what solutions should trade finance banks and and, and compliance actors be using when they're looking to kind of try and get an overall picture a helicopter view of a specific transaction very good question, and thank you for uh, for uh, asking this question because it's uh, illustrate. You have, I would say, three type of solution. You have the solution that are first linked to QIC and know your customer, and therefore it is mainly content and data. Whether you want to know this function PEP or this corporate information, and this is one of the strengths that we are having in Moody's. The second type of solution is the one that help you compare and reconcile a documentary credit. It is 20 page 
or 30 page and sometimes you are reading and you are missing one point which is either invoicing or the boat uh, reference or the vessel reference of the goods so taking a technology that can swallow scan this document and this document and do reconciliation this is very cool technology and they are existing in the market the third one is the one that track the activity of threat finance over time so we are not talking about spot, it's not fraud. We are talking about, let's take one year past transaction trading and do analysis and say, where this trading happened? Is it the same entity? Is it the same shipping? Is it the same country? Where it? I give you a very simple example. Recently, the uh, European Commission flagged uh, 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 an increase in washing machine in the CIS countries. Okay, which is Azerbaijan, uh, the country of uh, Russia. And it's funny because the, the, the second increase of machine, washing machine to a specific country, you can detect it through transaction, uh, how say, monitoring of trade finance, typically. And what they discovered, they discovered that one of the country was buying a huge amount number of washing machine because some of the parts was used for tanks and for of the military component, which we are talking here about dual use goods, which is the goods that can be used for a civil purpose. And there are some of the component can be used for a weapon, either weapon of my discretion or the war. And this is, you cannot track it if you are not having a transaction monitoring system that are profiling all the transactions that happen with your institution over the last, I would say, six, 12 months or more. Mohammed, thank you very much. I mean, we, we, we often talk about money laundering with an, with an image of money inside a washing machine spinning around in circles. And I think you've, you've given a very practical e example of, of, of why, you know, the, the import or purchase of washing machines into, into, a con into an economy can be, can be looked into. And, and I guess you can, you know, use the term dual use goods for a, 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 a transaction like that and how and why technology really is needed to, to, to consider some of those nuances and complications but thank you very much for uh taking us out of the dark and, and shedding some light into the uh the the, the real practicalities of managing um trade-based money laundering counter-terrorist financing and really looking at how do we how we prevent some of the bad actors from entering the trade system Mohammed, it's been such a pleasure thank you for joining me from dubai thank you for inviting me and for your time goodbye thank you Thank <laughs> you.